<clears throat> okay, so uh, today is the birthday of, uh, of uh, Patrick Schumacher. Uh, and uh, by the way of him, of course, we'll talk about the newer, the newer, not the new and also the newer works of Zaha Architects, uh, the, 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 the office, the large office that uh, he's a central part of. Uh, and um, there is much to say. But first, I will I will try to say something about the the relationship between uh, Zaha and uh, and Patrick. Uh, from what I understood, at first uh, uh, Zaha Hadi didn't want to hire him. Uh, that's what she declared. <laughs> and then you know she he became uh, you know he he it's not that he replaced her, but uh, in a way he did. The the office now is run by. Uh, uh, by uh, by him. So here is the man, uh, and um, he is a thinker. He has a PhD in uh, in, uh, in, in in theory uh, in philosophy, uh, and uh, he studied in several schools, both in Germany and and and, and Great Britain, maybe even in the States. I am not sure. Uh, here they, they are, the, the two of them, uh, behind them is a building which I am going to show, is, is one of the buildings, it's not a very large building, but is, is, is one of the buildings that I actually like the most, uh, built, uh, built by them. Uh, quite an interesting uh, pair, some people thought at one time that they were romantically involved, but apparently they were not. And as I said uh, the be uh, at the beginning, uh, Zaha didn't like him. That's what she declared. She didn't like uh, Patrick when when he applied for a job there. Uh, but uh, in in the end, he 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 uh, became essential to her. Uh, here they are uh, again, uh, you know, uh, uh, working. I imagine, or maybe uh, at a conference. I don't know, but. In, in, in the later years, um, Zaha without Patrick uh, would have been almost uh, inconceivable. Here they are. I like this picture very much with a younger Patrick Schumacher and, uh, and Zaha. Um, again, a very special condition, a very special situation, because most of the time in history, I mean, in, in, a, in the great majority of cases, we had uh, firms, architectural firms, founded and run by uh, men, and occasionally there was a woman there. You know, uh, sometimes the wife of the founder of the firm. But in this case, it was the woman who founded the firm, who brought fame to the firm and to her own works. And this young younger man, he he applied for a job at the firm, and now he's he's running. Um, you know, the office, quite a large office, as I said, with uh, more than 400 people. This is truly a very nice picture because uh, you can see he's not arrogant. He, is, uh, he has a seriousness which, with, uh, which we are to appreciate and many books behind. And uh, all in all, uh, he, well, not considering the, the, the early death of Zaha Hadid, this was a highly successful and is a highly successful architectural practice. Those who deny its, its significance in, in, uh, in the present uh, deny uh, the obvious. Here they are again, uh, you know, and somehow, I mean, I don't know, I'm not an expert in, uh, in uh, you know, Zaha Hadid architects or Patrick Schumacher for that matter, but I, Looking even at this picture, I, I feel that they are somehow like two teenagers or even two children, you know, they are grown up, but, and maybe both with a certain level of timidity, although, although Patrick Schumacher is very assertive in his, um, uh, you know, dealings with, uh, with society, with uh, architects and so on. But uh, sometimes this could be uh, misleading, maybe behind a certain, uh, you know, persona, 
uh, is, um, is, a, is, is a frightened kid or a, a timid one. It's, it's very possible. Anyway, I, I'm not in the position to psychoanalyze uh, Patrick Schumacher right now. Maybe next year I will know more about him. But we, can, we begin now the, the, the journey through some of the newer works. I, I'm sure there are even newer works, you know, the, the last, uh, you know, the last works they did, but I'll show uh, some of the works that were um, finalized after Zaha Hadid died um, five years ago. This is a project which didn't begin yet, a Russian mega smart city. I am personally um, usually turned off by smartphones or smart cities or smart buildings. I don't believe in such a thing. And if they are, somehow I feel, uh, you know, uncomfortable because uh, the human beings are less smart while the phones are smart, the buildings are smart and the cities are smart. Now, what I show are works that you know, almost by necessity, well, no, I shouldn't say so, uh, almost by necessity, neglected the problems that we are confronted with. That is sustainability, um, you know, the, the, the climate change, the ecological crisis. These things were not really addressed by Zaha Hadid and her office, at least until now. Maybe they try now through high technology to solve some of the problems which maybe at least in part were generated by uh, technology and i'm not sure that uh, the solution to problems uh, born from uh, technology can be solved through technology i'm not sure about this i know that this is the belief that we can solve all the problems even those that were provoked by technology through technology. I'm not sure about this. Zaha Hadid Architects working in collaboration with Russia-based TPO Pride Architects, quite a Russian name, has been selected as one of three consortiums to realize the, this uh, neighborhood in the west of, of Moscow. The team will work with fellow winners, uh, Nikki and Sekei from Japan and the uh, UNK project and anyway others to develop 4 million square meters of new buildings, 4 million squares, square meter buildings over 460 uh, hectares. Over one third of the new neighborhoods will be parklands and forest, bo forest bordering the Moscow River. But it's one third. The other two thirds are dominated again by uh, His Majesty Man, M-A-N the human being. And here is the, 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 the so-called smart city. I don't know. I mean, I look at it and um, I don't know uh, in what way is it smart. Maybe if it was to be smart, maybe it had to be a little bit more uh, reticent. After all, we are struggling now with uh, still with, uh, with, uh, with a terrible pandemic and with a terrible climate change and with the terrible rising levels of the sea and with the terrible melting down of icebergs. But when you look at this project, you don't have the feeling that there is anything going wrong, uh, going on wrong in the world. But again, this, this, this project was, was done a few years ago. All in all, I have seen, I have seen the library by Zaha Hadid in Vienna, in Austria, and I have to say that this excessive whiteness, uh, although I admire Zaha very much, uh, and, and uh, I admire the experimental work and I admire the, the, the audacious gestures, but, but when there is so much whiteness, well, here it is more glass than whiteness, but you have glass and whiteness, uh, I don't think you get what um, Zaha Hadid declared as being her goal, to have an, an architecture which is raw, R-A-W, uh, earthy or earthly, earthy, I am always confused about this, earthy or earthly, we understand, of the earth and vital. Maybe he, her architecture was and is vital, 
in, in, in the best buildings that she did, but they are certainly not raw and they don't truly really belong to the earth. They are rather sleek and white and uh, uh, you know, uh, the fluidity, which is uh, real, in my opinion, is not, uh, is not again, I, I have a, an inferiority complex about this word because I don't know how to pronounce it correct. I mean, I, is it earthy or earthly or both? Anyway, you understand, this was the desiderata, uh, this was the goal of Zaha Hadid to create an architecture that is raw, I mean, it's rough, raw, and her architecture is not raw at all. You know, uh, to, to make an architecture which is raw, you need either, you know, some kind of brutalism, uh, you know, rough concrete, or, uh, you know, use uh, stones and bricks, and uh, it's not raw. Her architecture is not raw at all, but that's what she declared. And it's not earthy or earthly, it, it doesn't, it doesn't belong to the earth. It's sleek and its fluidities uh, are uh, rather, uh, you know, uh, polished. Anyway, um, so yes, uh, formally they are interesting, but there is, uh, there is a but here because, uh, you know, they, they might appear a little bit, um, my opinion, too mundane and a little bit superficial, despite the you know the turmoil the or the turmoil of, of uh, the formal turmoil. Now this project in uh, in China, uh, let me see this one. There is a very nice. You can see uh, maybe you can photograph or make a screenshot of this. You can find on YouTube a very nice. Um, preliminary, well, preliminary is part of the project. Uh, the, this was not yet built, but is very well presented. The project itself of this uh, Changsha makes you uh, sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, you can find it on YouTube, and it's it 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 is remarkable considering uh, the the sophistication of the of the project. Uh, and but again, it's that sleek whiteness, which, despite the fact that it's fluid, is, uh, is, is somehow uh, artificial. Although, again, they search for uh, organicism, for some kind of uh, an unorganic architecture, but it's organic only in terms of lines, of, uh, I mean, graphically almost, of fluidities and not in terms of tactility and not in terms of tectonics. Although we will arrive at a diagram that Patrick Schumacher made, where the, the last phase of parametricism he, he called tectonism. And I guess there is an awareness within the office that uh, tectonism or tectonics is a field where they should make uh, more progress. It is interesting, but it shows it, it, there, is, there is a level of uh, triumphalism in this architecture, which again uh, ignores the, 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 you know, the troubles of our time. But it is true, this project was built, was, was proposed uh, before explicitly the climate change and the, you know, sustainability and all the rest came upon us. I personally admire this, this, this architectural vortexes because that's what they are. They are vortexes and without the uh, high technology that they use in, in, in their project, projects, they, they couldn't, we are going to see some projects that were built uh, they, they couldn't they couldn't even draw what what they imagined. So I wish just with these forms, but with different materials, I personally think the architecture would have been more convincing. But it's being so sleek and white, uh, it, it has a level of a high level of artificiality, which in my opinion is problematic. Otherwise, the formal vortex is, uh, is, is very convincing. 
And now you are going to see five Zaha Hadid design projects still to be finished following the architect's desk. Well, I had this presentation, parts of it uh, made um, one or two years ago. So in the meantime, some of these works were finalized. Um, again, we cannot separate easily Patrick Schumacher from the activities of uh, Zaha Hadid and certainly from the activity of the office. The Morpheus Hotel in Macau, which you probably saw, uh, which is a, you know, a striking uh, uh, hotel uh, that they built. And uh, you know, here we see an attempt to, uh, to have architecture, to have structure and ornament come together. And uh, you know, this, this conception of the structure of the building is so very different from what we see here or here. And uh, I imagine, this is my suspicion, but uh, maybe it's more than a suspicion. Uh, uh, Patrick Schumacher uh, has a role in this, and I think he loves the Gothic architecture. Uh, and, uh, you know, you would say, well, what's the relationship between the Gothic architecture and this building? Well, there is. Uh, in, in the way the structure is, uh, is conceived. Uh, and uh, he does mention sometimes Gothic cathedrals, uh, even in connection with very mundane projects like uh, the mega void um, uh, he, they built uh, in, uh, in, in China, which you are going to see a little bit later. Anyway, this is a remarkable building. Uh, Although the purists and the timids would contest it, would say, wait a minute, you know, it's a loss of money. Yes, I'm sure it was not an inexpensive building, but um, it is impressive. And uh, it would be a hypo hypocrite if we don't acknowledge that it is an impressive building. And it just, just try to imagine the calculations that they went through. I mean, the, the making, uh, making drawings, you know, working drawings, for these, you don't even know what they are. They are columns, they are beams, they are, what are they? Uh, 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 they are in between. I mean, they are, they, are, they are both. And the structure is at the outside of the building. And um, it's, it's, I, I think it's, it's a remarkable achievement. And again, this could not have been done if the office didn't have an extremely developed uh, even a research department. They have a great research department. 20, 30 people or so out of 400, 400 do just research. And by the way, I, there is a moment now where I can uh, afford or allow myself to be patriotic. But there are some Romanians there and I, I, um, I, uh, I, I watched a, a video uh, with uh, someone, a uh, Portuguese uh, young lady who works for Zaha Hadid. And when she talked about, ah, those Romanians, I felt admiration. I know there is Bogdan Zaha, for example, who uh, works there. And it's just a coincidence that his name is, is Zaha, his family name. But there are, I think, a few others. And they are very, very good at uh, scripting, programming, and uh, you know what uh, parametrics, parametric design, uh, um, you know, is based on or requires. Even inside the building is remarkable. I mean, look at this. You know, I mean, again, those who who contest uh, Zaha Hadid, they don't know what they are talking about. You know, just I mean, it's so easy to just make uh, white uh, white uh, rooms and white cubes with flat walls and flat ceilings and flat floors. To do something like this, you need uh, you need knowledge, you need a certain sensitivity, you need a, a, a highly uh, educated uh, body of people. You know, uh, you cannot build something, you cannot you, you cannot even draw it if you are not you know uh, top, so to speak. And and they build it. It was built. It is remarkable. I mean, yes, it is a hotel. Uh, it's not a cathedral, but uh, it is a, a remarkable building. Um, so, you know, 
it's amazing that uh, Patrick Schumacher, be, besides running such an office, now I'm sure he has a lot of help, but he also finds time to, to, to meditate on, on, on the future of architecture in, in, very, in a very articulated way. And uh, you know, to, to think theoretically in a very subtle and complex and even strong way. He's a man born and living for architecture. It's obvious. And uh, you know, we can wish him happy birthday now. Anyway, uh, this is in Macau. Uh, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, again, ju just, just this, this fragment of the building would require immense work and knowledge in order to be able to, to, to just draw it correctly. So those who contest the works of Zaha Hadid, in my opinion, are a little bit rushing uh, at, at their uh, conclusions. Yes, if there are weak points, I would say are, uh, but, but it's a conflict, you know, architecture, uh, unfortunately, is on the side of power, on the side of authority, on the side of so-called strength. Uh, um, it's a conflict, yes, I, I understand. How can we build in the present when we are confronted with uh, climate change and with the uh, issues of sustainability and with the pandemic and so on? Can we continue to be like this? But then the power of beauty of which Patrick Schumacher does have the courage to talk about uh, is, is an eternal uh, desiderata or desideratum for the human beings. Uh, you know, uh, yes, the, the, the concept of beauty changes, but beauty itself doesn't change our understanding of what beauty is. I, I personally think this kind of building expresses in a way our time, you know, the knot, the um, web realities. We are all in a network. And in a way, the very structure of this building is a network. There are contortions, yes, of course there are. And uh, there are very important architects today who contort their buildings. Why do they contort them? Well, because our, our maybe psychologies are contorted, our soul is contorted, our world is contorted. Uh, we live it uh, in a way, in a, in, a, in a complex and difficult time, maybe a transitional time. Um, now, you know this tower uh, in, in Miami, uh, which uh, was finalized, was, was built, uh, and uh, I don't know, this, this, this tower to, for me is a little bit uh, uh, rhetorical, uh, maybe more than a little bit. It has some interesting parts, but what bothers me is that, um, but then a lot of architecture would bother me is that it is a building celebrating, uh, you know, uh, the rich, uh, celebrating the power of money, celebrating real estate, celebrating um, speculative real estate, speculations at large scale. You can imagine how much uh, an apartment here costs and who lives here. You know, while there are so many poor uh, living at the edges of Miami. So there are many issues and not just, uh, not just ethical, but I would say also aesthetical. Uh, the paradox is that somehow the building seems to advocate a certain femininity, but actually the building is very phallic. And, and, and this kind of paradox appears in other, uh, uh, in other works by them. Um, so, you know, uh, what is the difference between this building and this building? And I'm not even commenting on its, uh, you know, resemblance to certain things. Uh, it's essentially all these buildings are, are uh, celebrations of, uh, of uh, uh, masculinism uh, that, that uh, cannot be denied. Uh, 
And this one even makes explicit that uh, masculinism, in my opinion. Maybe too much so. The, the Star is a, a, a publication, a newspaper in, in Miami, which said Zaha Hadid's exoskeleton tower, an instant Miami landmark. That word exoskeleton is also the word that uh, uh, applies to the structure of the uh, Macau hotel that we just saw, because the structure is indeed an exoskeleton an exoskeleton, even more than in Miami, much more, I would say, than in Miami. But this sensationalism, you know, it's an instant Miami landmark. For whom? For the people, uh, you know, who can afford to contemplate the beautiful water and the beautiful sky. I understood the rather incredible uh, balconies, you know, uh, where you can, uh, uh, you have a party with 100 people at least, very wide and very long. Again, it, it is a building for the rich and affluent, but how, how did those rich and affluent make their money? Most of them through capitalistic enterprises, through speculative, uh, through speculations, you know, in real estate and not only in real estate. Um, so, it is a triumphalism which, which turns me off, actually. I, I, I don't like the symbolism of this tower and even aesthetically, in my opinion, it's, it's inflated. It's, I mean, look at this, you know, and again, its resemblance to certain parts of the male's body are almost obscene. But, you know, that's not what the star considered and maybe other people as well. I'm sure at a, from certain points of view, it's interesting, but think about the amount of concrete here and concrete pollutes dramatically. Um, this is certainly not a sustainable building. It's certainly not a building that, uh, uh, you know, is worried about the rising levels of the sea or the melting of the iceberg, is not. I know there is a conflict because, uh, you know, if you only think of the melting of the iceberg and the rising uh, level of the, of the seas, maybe you, you abstain from building to begin with. You won't build on anything. And maybe, yes, as somebody said, the most sustainable way to build is to not build at all. Uh, it's very possible that uh, it is so. Otherwise, in terms of, you know, the graphics of the work uh, and, uh, you, know, the, you know, the amplitude of the effort, the, the reason, there was a lot of work here and, uh, you know, uh, talent and, uh, you know, uh, craft and the, but, but I think there is a but with this building because, again, it has a triumphalism, which I think is um, almost anachronistic with our time. And not just at the level of, the, of society, uh, in, 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 in other ways as well. Look at the ceiling. Yes, it is or could be impressive. Yes, it is interesting. But again, who is swimming in this swimming pool here? Who, who, uh, certainly not the blue collar workers and the, you know, uh, the many, many uh, poor people who, who live at the edge of uh, Miami you would say, wait a minute, we are talking about architecture and beauty. We are not concerned with the poor at the, end, at the edge of the city, but they exist. And I don't think it's correct to ignore them. And the beauty that ignores them in my, in my opinion is problematic, if it is a beauty. But again, as I said, it's too much whiteness and too much slickness. And uh, it, to me, this is not truly a very complex architecture, although formally it appears to be so. Yes, you can take some interesting pictures like this one. I would agree. But um, the, the, the level of rhetoric, as I said, seems to me uh, a little high, maybe a little more than uh, a little. 
Esfera city center in Montre Monterey, uh, Mexico, uh, is, you know, when I made this, it uh, opens in 2018, but I don't think it was built or finalized. This high density residential building, uh, uh, it's a complex of buildings. The designer's first project in Mexico comprises nine, uh, 981 flats and spans nine stories at its highest point. The flats range from single person lofts measuring 485 square feet to 592 anyway, to four bedroom flats measuring. Again, we are talking about an elite who is going to live here, you know? So to me, this is a problem. You know, when Le Corbusier said, I stay away from parties, mundane parties, I prefer to talk with fishermen at the edge of the sea, you know, I, I, I'm afraid that actually it's possible that Zaha died because she was too estranged. I mean, died, uh, you know, uh, prematurely. She was too estranged from the roots of life. Who were her friends, so to speak? You know, fashion people, you know, uh, high fashion people. And uh, there was a level of mundanity which in my opinion, uh, uh, was problematic. And I'm afraid she paid the price for it. If she would have done maybe uh, sometimes, you know, social housing and work for uh, I don't think she was an arrogant person, no. But I just think she got uh, involved with a segment of society, and that is with a 1%, not with the 99%. Even in Mexico, I mean, look at this. This looks like a luxurious hotel. Who can afford to live in a building by Zaha Hadid? Now, today we are supposed to pay homage to celebrate Patrick Schumacher, but he's, uh, we cannot dissociate him from, uh, uh, from, from the buildings that uh, Zaha Hadid architects proposed and built. In fact, he was, uh, you know, uh, central to, 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 to this activity. This is though a work which I like. It's a smaller museum in Michigan, uh, in the United States. Uh, and uh, I think it's an interesting work. Um, maybe also because I, I don't see that excessive whiteness any longer and that excessive slickness. And here there are interesting surfaces uh, generated from uh, you know rectangular uh, elements or, or orthogonality but placed in a certain way uh, it's it's not bad and and the interior has you know like these black parts uh, remind one of his her um, museum built in cincinnati uh, a very early work in her career um, so even inside there, there isn't so much whiteness as it is in some other works by, in most uh, works actually by her. Uh, it's still not raw and it's still not earthy or earthly, it's not, but um, the abstraction of the building is not so, uh, um, it is abstract, yes, but it's not, uh, uh, it has a certain variety, which in my opinion is, uh, is, is, is pleasant. On the other hand, uh, you know, the, the glass surfaces, uh, yes, here you have lines which are not perpendicular on the earth because the surface is not perpendicular on the earth. Uh, and the rhythm has a certain variety, but still all in all between the opaque parts of the building and the glassed parts of the building, there isn't something intermediary. It's like, you know, they, they are the two parts which compose the building. Now, um, Beijing New International Airport in China opens, it opened already, and it is a, an impressive uh, airport, but, but what do you do with these airports when we, we are forced by the pandemic to promote uh, social distancing and kind of to stay at home? to cope with growing outbound traffic. Well, this statement was made before the pandemic. Um, so, uh, you know, imagine 4.5 billion trips were taken by Chinese tourists last year. 
last year, I don't know, maybe this was written in 2017 or so, according to the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, 4 point billion trips. China is building what is built as the world's biggest airport, unofficially called the Beijing International Airport. The site is 67 kilometers south of the capital. It will have seven runaways, cost $12 billion, and is designed to handle 100 million passenger a year, passengers by the year 2040. But who knows? You know, who knows what will happen by 240? You know, maybe the seas will uh, rise their levels to incredible heights. Uh, maybe, I hope not. Uh, and I hope that the pandemic will be defeated. But, but the, this, this excessive movement uh, was reduced dramatically in the past two years, designed to look like a phoenix spreading, spreading its wings Construction was delayed in December last year when more than 200 tombs from the Qing dynasty were unearthed, unearthed during construction. But this uh, statement was made a few years ago, maybe 2017. And it, anyway, it was built like this. And I think it is a remarkable building uh, for an airport. And, uh, you know, what can we say? China is doing the most extravagant some of the most extravagant buildings in the world. And, uh, you know, uh, as Patrick Schumacher said, uh, uh, China is ascending now in the field of architecture with great speed and, uh, you know, uh, dramatically. Inside, like we saw in other buildings by her and not just the ones I presented, the same slickness, which for me is a little bit uh, bothering and uh, also whiteness. Well, it's not just whiteness here, but a lot of whiteness. Otherwise, uh, otherwise there are interesting things. I, I, I like the building most when it was during the construction. And you, we are going to see some pictures when the building was not yet finalized, was not finished, so to speak. Uh, and it was very, uh, you know, uplifting and alive and uh, visceral and interesting. Um, yes, there are sophistications here, which without uh, its majesty, the computer uh, could not have been built. But for example, Kenneth Frampton uh, mentioned to me that uh, the computer destroyed architecture. Quite a strong statement. Um, I don't know if it is like this, but maybe we should think about, uh, about what he said. I don't think the computer destroyed architecture. Maybe our excessive belief, our lack of modesty destroyed architecture. Uh, now, maybe they are related to an extent. Anyway, this kind of building would not have been built uh, at other times. Uh, you know, uh, there are very interesting things going on here. And, and, and you know, it's one thing to imagine it, um, like Napoleon, I just read that uh, this year, there are 200 years since Napoleon died, Napoleon. And he said that imagination rules the world. And uh, Einstein said the same thing. Uh, imagination is the most important thing, more important than knowledge. And I believe it's true. But this thing, in order to be built, a lot of imagination went into it. You might like it. I, 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 I have some doubts about its interior, but all in all is a, you know, a, almost a phantasmagoric effort to coordinate such a work is, is and the cost, you know, 12 billion dollars uh, so what will happen with this airport if, if the pandemic continues and if, uh, of course, the touristic industry uh, is, is uh, on its knees almost. People still travel, but uh, in much less numbers. Uh, anyway, look at, look at it during the construction. You know, it's almost some kind of a, like a, 
white, uh, white, uh, large, um, uh, you know, low height or uh, flat almost, uh, well, not quite flat, cathedral. It's huge. It's huge and it is impressive that this structure is, uh, is, uh, is you know, uh, mind blowing. You know, it's... Patrick Schumacher was here, you know, he, he was already, uh, you know, uh, Zaha's uh, best friend, so to speak. He, he, he made these things possible just like Zaha did. They worked together for this. So on his birthday, it is only normal to show this work as well. This giant, the largest airport in the world, as it was described. Now, this is another work in Saudi Arabia. Um, it was declared that it would open in 2019, but I don't think it opened, or I don't know. This beautifully designed project has all the distinctive trademark curves of a, a Hadith structure, a key part of the city transport network. The station is on the edge of the King Abdullah financial district. Of course, it had to be and will function as a major interchange between three of the city's six new metro lines. Now, I look at this and, uh, you know, um, I'm ambivalent about it. On one hand, uh, you know, maybe I appreciate the, you know, the uniqueness of the design, but on the other hand, isn't it very big and, uh, you know, voluminous, is, is, isn't it, uh, flamboyantly so. I mean, again, uh, you know, there is a level of uh, triumphalism here, which uh, I, I, I'm, I have a hard time to, to totally accept. I mean, you know, where did the money come from? From the oil, no? Uh, the oil, exploiting the oil, the earth until, until, until death, until the end. And then we invest in these huge things, you know, it's a metro life for God's sake, you know, it's not, uh, it's not even the Louvre, you know, it's, it's, it's a metro line. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I see something almost apocalyptical here, you know, even all, all these buildings, you know, uh, going higher and higher and this, this horizontal building by, by Zaha Hadid architects, uh, with a you know uh, an, uh, a voluptuous energy, with uh, it's something about it, in my opinion, not quite real. Anyway, it's an interpretation. I am subjective. I, I acknowledge it. Uh, in, in case I, uh, I I evaluate it wrongly, I apologize. But. Uh, uh, sometimes, and I, I love creativity, and I love vitality, and I love, uh, you know, experiments, but I almost appreciate this building more by comparison, you know, or uh, at least it's, it's, it's a balance, you know, this, this uh, mammoth uh, work um, uh, tells me off. And look at the highway, you know. I mean, we talk about uh, pollution, we talk about... Uh, uh, climate change. We talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, what the effect of all this running with the cars on the highways have on, on the climate. And yet, what do we see here? The same triumphalism of, of, of taking of, of uh, uh, the, the domination of nature and of the world by a human being which do who doesn't know his limits, you know, and uh, I have a trouble with this. Yes, the interior could be interesting, but again, why so much whiteness? You know, uh, it's too much whiteness, in my opinion, and too much slickness. I, I, again, I, I, I was in one of her buildings, the library in Vienna, which is also like this white. And again, I admire Zaha Hadid. I made presentations on her. Two weeks after she died, I asked for a minute of silence in Sala Freschelor when Wolf Prix was there in her memory. I do admire her, but this slick whiteness uh, that, that does turn me off. 
And uh, in the library in Vienna, uh, I, I went with the students uh, a few times and uh, that building doesn't tell you I am a library. No, it could be anything. Yes, it's interesting somehow uh, spatially, but uh, there is a but. Anyway, one North master plan in Singapore uh, opens in 2021. Singapore, as we know, is the country, is the Switzerland of Southeast Asia. This plan for a large neighborhood in the city state capable of serving a population of 138,000 is a true reflection of the avant-garde sketches from early on in Hadid's career. Now let's see. Um, it's not, uh, I don't even know if it started the work. Um, they, I mean, they did so many projects, you know, some were built, some were not built and they keep doing that, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Now the sound wave concert hall by Zaha Hadid architects in, uh, in Russia, uh, it's a project, I think they won the competition, but the, the project didn't uh, yet start to be built. The building didn't yet start. Uh, the design of the sound wave concert hall is based on the properties of musical sound resonance, creating wave vibrations in a continuous smooth surface. You saw the word smooth. Well, the word smooth is in opposition to the word raw, R-A-W which was the goal, the declared goal, goal of Zaha Hadid, which she actually never uh, moved towards. The result is amazing and we can't wait to see the finished result. This was someone uh, you know, who, uh, in, in the administration of the building, of the, of the project or, or the competition. Anyway, this is a project for, for Russia. Um, the, the variety of the works is amazing. I mean, they, 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 they they continuously reinvent themselves, but there is a style to use a favorite word for, for uh, Patrick Schumacher. He loves this word style. And this to me is a little bit problematic because I know very good architects like Ginny Gang, but not just her. I personally think most very good architects would have rejected to, uh, to be uh, known as, uh, as uh, you know, promoters of a style. It's very interesting that this very intelligent and intense man, Patrick Schumacher, relies so much on this word, smile, uh, not smile, sorry, uh, style. Concert halls are often grand buildings. I don't know, I don't feel like reading. This is a text written by a conductor or someone uh, working for this philharmonic. Uh, let's look, uh, let's look at the building. The interior of a concert hall is, you know, not very different from other interiors of concert halls. They have to house a lot of people and, you know, the, it's like a uterus, like a womb, a large room with, where the sound is very important, of course. Uh, so Zaha Hadid architects uh, enter the competition with a design proposal for this 1,600 seat concert hall. The sound wave inspired concept also includes a suspended canopy appearing to float above the new Civic Plaza that is both the lobby of the Philharmonic Concert Hall and an enclosed urban square. The 21st century addition will complement the existing ensemble. Uh, what can we say? This is just a project. It was not yet built. Maybe it will not be built. I don't know. Um, moving forward uh, but maybe i should read this you know russia has been a has been a formative influence on zaha hadid architects well uh, on on zaha hadid because she was very very influenced by uh, constructivist by malevich in particular from very early in her career zaha was attracted to the russian avant-garde who conceived civic spaces as urban condensers that catalyze a public realm of activity to enrich creativity and community, allowing space itself to enhance our understanding and well being. These principles are embedded within the design of this concert hall. Dimitri Lee's artistic director uh, and a member of the design competition, Jerry said For musicians, this new hall is crucial. It will be a musical instrument that brings the sound to life. Okay. 
where you can find on YouTube uh, more elaborated uh, uh, presentations of this project. Now we arrive at something very interesting, in my opinion, almost crucial to understanding Patrick Schumacher. I took this, uh, this, uh, this uh, image and the next one from, uh, from uh, his uh, presentations, uh, both on the web and in lectures. He claimed that parametricism is following deconstructivism by the time he made this statement one or two years ago, maybe three years ago, with four uh, subsidiary styles. Again, he loves the word style. To me, this is a little problematic, but you can read on his website, patrickschumacher.com, what he means by style. What is interesting is that he identifies within modernity six subsidiary styles, starting with functionalism at the beginning of the 20th century, then going through organicism, rationalism, brutalism, metabolism, and high tech. I'm afraid that in Romania, we are still trapped by that functionalism, meaning the first step of modernity or within modernity. Uh, and then you had two transitional styles, as he calls them, postmodernism and then deconstructivism. Interesting that he calls them transitional styles. And then an epochal style. So after modernism, he concludes that there is parametricism. Interesting that he doesn't identify parametricism with modernism. Uh, this is interesting and in my opinion, debatable because I think parametricism is modernism. We are still within modernity. Uh, and within parametricism, he identifies foldism, blobism, swarmism, and lastly, tectonism. Um, not commenting on these uh, on these isms, which refer to systems, uh, and this also I feel is problematic. And not commenting on the on the on the on using the word style. The this uh, chronology, uh, without uh, specifying the years, is interesting. I think you know functionalism, organicism, rationalism, brutalism, metabolism high-tech, then transitional, as he called them, styles, postmodernism and deconstructivism, and then parametricism with its foldings, foldisms, blobism, swarmism, and tectonism. And this, the next uh, you know, diagram, or how to call it, is interesting too, because he has on two coordinates, order and freedom, he traces a certain history of architecture. He calls it the one in, let's say, before Renaissance vernacular. I'm not very sure about, the, about this, but as you can see, as you move from, let's say, the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages upwards in time towards Renaissance, the level of order increases and the level of uh, freedom increases a little bit. Now, on both coordinates, if we are moving upwards. Then we come downwards a little bit from the Baroque classicism, historicism. So what he's saying is that uh, from Baroque onwards, the level of freedom is uh, increasing a little bit, but the level of order is decreasing a little bit. This also to me is a little bit debatable. Then we move onwards and modernism, let's say the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, freedom increases, but order decreases. We are going downwards. Postmodernism also increases the, the freedom uh, because we move to the right uh, following this arrow, but at lower levels uh, uh, on, 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 the, on this coordinate, the vertical one, deconstructivism is at the lowest in terms of order, but it is at the highest or well, uh, at, uh, at, at its uh, longest in terms of freedom. So deconstructivism had the maximum, well, 
not really. Until this point, compared to what preceded it, it had the most freedom, but the least order. And then from deconstructivist on, which compared to, I mean, referring to his scheme, parametricism started. And so from deconstructivism, we begin to grow again. So both freedom and uh, order increase. So this is his point, I think, in defending and advocating parametricism, that parametricism allows you to be both free and ordered. And this is why Patrick Schumacher thinks that we should uh, build a solid science of building, science of architecture, science having to do with order, with reason, with, uh, you know, with, uh, with, uh, yeah, with, uh, with things which are not too capricious. But for the first time, maybe in history, freedom is at its highest, or, you know, yes, and also order. You see, parametricism excels both in, at the level of freedom and at the level, uh, level of order. This is his conception and his desire, in a way. If indeed it is so, it remains to be seen, but I think Patrick Schumacher does have a vision and he strongly believes in this vision. My, you know, my reticence is partly born from the fact that he still believes in capitalism, uh, although in a, a post uh, Fordist capitalism, uh, which to me is uh, not always uh, truly sustainable and we might pay the price for its successes and its triumphalism. Tectonism, which again, in this we see is the latest, well, he made this uh, scheme, uh, uh, you know, uh, he, he drew it, he wrote it, uh, he con conceived it uh, a few years ago, but I think we are still around here at what he called tectonism. And he gives some example of tecto tectonist uh, architecture or using the, the style, um, you know, the subsidiary style of tectonism. He is very fond of, uh, uh, of uh, certain architecture that employs, of course, digital culture, a uh, very sophisticated one. Uh, and um, uh, these are examples of what he thinks, uh, you know, uh, is worth, is a, is a worthy architecture and a worthy design for our time, a tectonist architecture, a tectonist design. Um, he, there is much to say. He, I think, uh, I myself, I'm not totally prepared to, 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 to comment uh, with a lot of conviction about uh, all these issues. That's why I myself will, will, uh, will read more on his website, patrickschumacher.com. And those of you who are interested in, 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 uh, in investigating these ideas uh, uh, to do the same. He thinks that Mark Form, who designed this, for example, and built it, is the rising star of the 21st century. Mark Forn is an architect uh, whose work I presented a few times and I will continue to present. Now, if he is indeed the, you know, the rising star uh, of uh, architecture in the 21st century, I don't know. But he is someone who should be known. And um, he's not the only one, of course. But yes, he did say so about, uh, about Mark Forn. Um, who also works with the scripting, programming, parametrics, and uh, parametric design. And you see here insinuations of the Gothic somehow, done with, with very, uh, you know, uh, complex uh, present uh, technologies. Also, you know, possible uh, uh, references uh, or a certain dialogue with uh, uh, modernistic uh, uh, Gothicist uh, sensibility, if I am to call it so. All in all, I think uh, his theoretical research uh, is, uh, is, uh, is worthy of being investigated 
uh, and uh, maybe we'll talk uh, some other time about this. Now I'll show uh, work in more detail, which I think is uh, one of the most uh, intriguing and uh, commented and uh, some people like it, some people dislike it. Uh, very important work in Seoul, in South Korea from 2014. Um, again, in 2016, Zaha Hadid died, but in 2014, she was working with Patrick Schumacher and they were both the designers of this giant a uh, giant building, which is halfway between being a building and being some kind of a uh, artificial uh, landscape. I think it's a very interesting work. Uh, it's certainly uh, ravish is the rationalistic paradigm, the Cartesian paradigm. Um, but, but at the level of the tectonics, in my opinion, is problematic again, because it is slick, it is artificial, it's, um, it doesn't have that, uh, that materiality that, for example, in a square inch, Carlos Scarpa, for example, was able to say so much. But of course, this is a different kind of architecture, different kind of building. It has nobility and it has faults. I mean, look at these concrete columns. Everything is, 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 is uh, in a way, uh, Patrick Schumacher was right about marrying freedom with order. There is a level, a high level of freedom here, but it's not a freedom that, that turns into chaos. It's not, this is not deconstructivism. In that sense, he is right. Um, and uh, it, it, is a, it is an architecture that sustains itself. It is, uh, it is somehow balanced, although its forms are, uh, you know, uh, eccentric. Again, what bothers me is the white slickness of the interior. It's, it's, uh, it amazes me that an architect like Zaha Hadid, who claimed that she was searching for a raw architecture, did something like this, which is the opposite of being raw. R-A-W is, I don't know what she felt. Also, this is not earthy at all. And she claimed she was searching for an earthy, raw architecture. She betrayed her uh, desiderata, her goal. And I don't know very well why, in the name of this slick, mundane artificiality. But the building has, uh, I, I just, I, I mean, when I look at this, I feel like uh, talking now a little bit about Tzvi uh, Hacker, who uses, uh, earthy materials and he arrives uh, in some of his works at, at the rawness which I believe uh, uh, Zaha Hadid would have benefited from. But otherwise this giant building, and it is a giant building, is, uh, is, is I think enticing and interesting, even the drawings. I have here many drawings from March Daily. You will see in terms of graphics, it's, 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 it is free. You know, uh, the, the forms are manipulated with, uh, with uh, a lot of uh, vitality and, 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 uh, and freedom. Too bad the tactility, the, the tectonics of the building, in my opinion, are, and I think Patrick Schumacher knows this. This is why he, he mentioned tectonism to be the last phase until now of this, uh, I mean, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, part of, uh, of, the, uh, of the evolution of parametrics. I mean, it's, it's, it's visceral, it's organic, it's labyrinthical, it's, uh, it's also not, uh, it has a, an inner order. So I think he was right. You know that that somehow you know this last phase of parametricism is able to unite order with freedom. And I have just too many drawings here, and they are a little bit small. But uh, I didn't have enough for the other projects, so I left them. But look at this building, which is giant. Because look, look at you know, look at other buildings around it. It is giant. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a well.
and it was built. I mean, you know, just these things happening here. Can you imagine controlling all of this, you know, and uh, making working drawings for all of them? And then the power of the structure here is, but, but uh, again, this is concrete. This means pollution. And, uh, you know, I don't think that today in our time, we, we can continue to be like this. This was building done uh, seven years ago, but uh, in the present, uh, it is difficult to sustain this, this uh, technology. I mean, this, this, uh, the materiality of the building in this way. And nevertheless, it was uh, an experiment. And uh, again, when I see this whiteness, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I feel like being uh, less uh, appreciative, but, uh, Anyway, so this is in Seoul. Uh, uh, this looks, uh, by the way, this looks very, very, very similar with the interior of the library in the university campus in Vienna that I was talking about. It looks just like this. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, it, it isn't even so, uh, so, so new any longer. But there are other things that are very different, like, you know, these curves, which, by the way, we cannot, we cannot easily be like this without uh, parametric design, without scripting, programming, and all the technology we have at our disposal. Now, this is a, a tower which you probably saw being published. Uh, it was uh, built after she died, the Lisa Soho Tower in Beijing. And, you know, this is, he talks in his theory about the mega loft the mega uh, void. Indeed, this tower has a, a mega void. It, it is the tallest in the world. But conceptually, this building is intriguing and uh, paradoxical because towards the outside is a masculine statement, while this void is, a, you could call it, uh, if you, you know, uh, desire so, a feminist statement. And, you know, I mean, this building is, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe I, I see too much in it or too little, but uh, 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 at the conceptual level, I, I, I feel there is some kind of a, uh, um, inversion here, you know, because um, the male is outside and the, and the, and the female is inside. That, that's what I see. Uh, Anyway, it's amazing that it was built, yes, but, but um, I'm not so sure about it. I understand uh, the, the quest for a dynamic, for dynamic relationships within the building, all this, the tallest atrium in the world, but, but the skin, the, 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 you know, the, the periphery of the building is almost rather predictably, uh, you know, uh, Without uh, any uh, anything dynamic, it's 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 a tower like all the others, except that it's round. And yes, the interior it's almost it's it's almost the negation of the tower. What I see here, they built this is not a cylinder because this is not perfectly, but you know it could be approximated as a cylinder, and then they dissected it, and this with this vulva-like shape. Uh, on, on so many floors. There is uh, the spiral present here, the twisting, the duality, uh, of course, but still with something artificial, I would say. Uh, especially the skin, I think, is problematic because it's, um, you know, in a way to express myself in French, is la même Jeannette autrement coiffe. Is the same Jeannette, but with a different coiffure. He wanted to create, uh, and he talks about uh, this building, Patrick Schumacher, a different kind of skyscraper, but it, it's only apparently different. Uh, this big atrium, which uh, is, yes, it's a big luxury to, to have it, and probably you, you, you could even get vertigo or, you know, could be very impressive. He even mentions the Gothic Cathedral. Uh, it could be very impressive. 
but uh, and I admire you know this uh, uh, vortex, but um, especially during the construction, it's, it's, it seems to be more real because it's not yet finished, it's not yet slick. When it is slick, uh, in essence, you have the same. I mean, you play with the with the shapes, with the curves, but you still have the same kind of architecture. You know, with the long. Uh, rows of uh, glass of windows and uh, you know uh, beams and uh, I, I don't think it's so different as, as he thinks it is. Yes, the atrium, but this was done also by uh, Wolf Prix and Kopp Himmelblau at the uh, headquarters of the uh, European Central Bank and many other buildings. Even John Portman in, in a different way. He also has huge atrium. So it's not it's not so unique. I mean, what is maybe, maybe, maybe uh, a little bit different is the, 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 the fact that it was built with these twistings and uh, this, this twist uh, and the spiral and so on. But otherwise, look at this. From far away, if you don't notice that atrium, it's, it's another glass tower, essentially, quite phallic. This is why I said uh, the masculinism of this project. Uh, uh, this is what he said, he, he wrote, Patrick Schumacher, as with our Macau project, it is important that the mega atrium is not a hermetic space, but also visually connects with the surrounding urban fabric. This reduces vertigo and enhances the sensation of freedom. Entering this space delivers a viscerally uplifting experience reminiscent of the tallest Gothic cathedrals. This too is in architecture's power. Yeah, but there is a difference between a Gothic cathedral and this tower. This tower is an office building uh, and we know what kind of activities take place in, a, in an office building, which are not at all uh, associated uh, with uh, what we call freedom. While the Gothic cathedral was the house of God. So, but it's interesting that he 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 has he has in his mind this uh, this uh, presence, you know, the, the the Gothic cathedral, and he 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 has a dialogue with it. You know, it's almost like a, a continuous uh, challenge coming from the Middle Ages. Now another mega atrium, uh, which which was supposed to be built and the construction construction started in Wuhan where the pandemic apparently started from. I mean, even uh, uh, I, um, Wei, Wei, Wei Wei said that, um, well, in an irreverential way, he said that, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the pandemic, the COVID, I mean, the relationship with the COVID, he said the, the Italian is like, just like with the pasta. The Chinese invented it and the Italians spread it all over the world. Well, in this, he actually said, uh, you know, uh, the COVID started in, in China. Who knows? But the first, uh, you know, uh, images with people uh, succumbing to the, to the pandemic uh, came from Wuhan. And exactly in Wuhan, ZHA, uh, Zaha Hadid Architects, um, projected this, I mean, it started the construction, maybe it's uh, approaching uh, its final stages. I don't know, it's supposed to open in 2022. Uh, uh, he talks, Patrick Schumacher, about high intensity urban order. And, um, you know, here you see some images. It's a tower. I mean, yes, look at this uh, atrium. It is immense, it's true. But, but uh, somehow I cannot forget that uh, uh, it seems the pandemic started here. So the triumphalism of this structure is now, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in some kind of a conflict with the new realities. Uh, and so um, I'm not trying to say that we should, we should uh, stop thinking in, uh, in courageous terms and uh, experiment and so on. No, we should continue, but, but we are confronted with real issues in the present that at the time when they made this project didn't exist. 
or we didn't anticipate that. You know, uh, it's, um, in my opinion, there is a level of, uh, of demagogy here, as maybe there was also in the, in the project by, uh, Lar uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright in the Larkin, Larkin building. It's this belief, unending belief in, in the human being and in so-called freedom. But, you know, look at the human insect here on the floor, you know, and look what's above. Now you could say, who knows, maybe one thinks of God being here on the floor of this giant office building in Wuhan, where the pandemic started from. Yes, there are interesting uh, uh, curves here, interesting uh, vortexes. Uh, it's it's rather dynamic, but but if you make abstraction of the lines in themselves, essentially the the you know the architecture is not so complex. You know you have uh, floors just like in any other office building, uh, and uh, you know stacked one above the other. And then with a big hole, a big atrium uh, within. Uh, now they proposed this uh, to be, they just won this competition very recently. And uh, Bogdan Zaha was part of the, of the project team. Uh, Zaha had the architects to build, uh, we end very soon, to build Tower C at Shenzhen uh, base, super head, headquarters base. Uh, um, I mean, I'm not saying that there is a lot of uh, a lot to be appreciated here. You know, there is uh, a great ability to 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 configure uh, two towers that are almost in a in an erotical uh, relationship here. You know, the male and the female, perhaps, you know, dancing together or almost embracing. Maybe it's an indirect commentary on the on the on the twin towers in in New York. Uh, they are not the only ones. Uh, shop architects also built uh, two towers uh, in Manhattan, uh, smaller, less, uh, less ambitious, but uh, there is something in the air, so to speak. Of course, we have uh, curves, we have sinu sinu sinuousness, we have, uh, we have a certain level of uh, organicities, but there is also a level of slickness, which again, um, shows, I think, uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe an almost exaggerated uh, belief in uh, our ability, the human's ability to transcend our difficulties and to, 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 to bring para the paradise that we were banished from on earth. And we know this is not the case. <laughs> because there is a lot of garbage in the world, because Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. So this uh, triumphalism, uh, which is also immensely expensive, in my opinion, is problematic. And it celebrates uh, capitalism in an unending uh, quest for higher and higher, deeper and deeper, wider and wider, and so on. The, the conquest of the earth by the human beings um, is uh, evaluated in terms of, uh, of, uh, of luxury in a way and dimensions, mundanity. Uh, it's, it's, um, I'm not very impressed by it. Formally, yes, it is interesting, but, uh, but um, I'm not very impressed because what I see here is that unending assault of the human being on the earth. And um, when are we going to stop? You know, yet, yet we do have to acknowledge certain qualities that are at work here. And uh, that's why uh, I, I chose to, to, uh, to celebrate Patrick Schumacher today on his birthday. And this is the last, if I can call it image, the last page of the presentation, which it is a statement that, that, that he made. And this is, this is a, 
a statement I would I would totally support uh, and sustain because I believe in it too. And I believe the students should consider it very seriously. Ornament and structure are not separate. Unfortunately, we are still obsessed by structure and we don't even mention ornament. But Patrick Schumacher said it clearly in a lecture and he wrote about this and I totally believe in this. Ornament and structure are not separate. They should come together. So happy birthday, uh, Patrick Schumacher. And thank you for uh, those of you who are still here. <laughs>